This is my brother Eli. He is a hardworking, personable young kid, and I'm lucky to call him my brother. He is so, so musically gifted, he can play literally every instrument, and is so self-motivated that he took a semester off college just to teach himself Japanese, four different coding languages, and the art of day trading. Clearly, he's an incredible kid with many talents, but unfortunately for Eli, he cannot draw. He struggles with creating steady straight lines, artistic perspective, and shading. <sighs> yeah, Eli felt pretty bad about his artistic abilities, and those feelings were only exacerbated every time he walked into the art studio for class. No matter how much I tried to help, he really just couldn't get the hang of it. But the good news for Eli is that art only took up about 45 minutes of his days back in high school. And once he graduated, he never really had to deal with those feelings of inadequacy ever again. For the remainder of his time, his days were filled with classes where his logical thinking abilities and natural academic intellect could shine through. Classes like math and English, for example. So all in all, this struggle with drawing or inability to draw didn't really impede a sense of self-confidence all that much. It was just a skill that he would try to avoid. Well, what if I told you I had a very similar story? Like my brother, I consider myself to be a bright student. And also like him, I struggle with something. But for me, that thing is reading. I have dyslexia. So similar to how Eli struggles with artistic perspective and shading, I struggle with spelling and reading fluency. Those feelings of inadequacy that Eli felt every day during art class is how I felt about pretty much every other class that wasn't art or physical education. I noticed very early on, too, that everyone, parents, teachers alike, seemed to care a lot more about the things that Eli was good at than the things that I was good at. So even when I excelled in art, for example, it just never felt good enough because it wasn't math. So as you can see, I couldn't just follow in the footsteps of my brother and dismiss my struggles with reading or wait till I graduated high school to escape it. <laughs> no. I had to face my struggles for hours a day, every day, and still do, because my one weakness is the very foundation of our education system. In other words, if you struggle to read, you're struggling to learn. But at the end of the day, though, both reading and drawing are just skills. So why is it that I'm labeled as disabled? Am I disabled? Or am I just differently abled? Let's look at the brain. So our brain is divided into two hemispheres, right and left. This left hemisphere of the brain is specialized for activities like reading and spelling. So for non-dyslexic people, like my brother, for example, they utilize this area of the brain to read, write, and spell with relative ease. My brain works a little differently. <laughs> So instead of experiencing this increased activation on the left side, it's actually happening on the right. Now, this right hemisphere is not specialized for reading and spelling, but rather for more holistic, nonlinear, abstract thought. So how does this affect reading? Um, well, <laughs> imagine trying to use a spoon to cut a steak. It's possible, <laughs> but it's by no means the most efficient way of getting the job done. Similarly, that's how the dyslexic brain works. We're using the part of our brain that's not specialized for the task at hand, which then makes the overall task of reading something that's a lot more laborious and frustrating. And this gives rise to things like uh, spelling errors and misreading words out loud, which, you know, granted, might not seem like the biggest deal, uh, but I can tell you this, it is not the best feeling. In fact, it's kind of a bad feeling when you're a senior in college and still struggle to spell the word comfortable reliably. <laughs> it's pretty uncomfortable, actually. <laughs> now, for me in art class, this is not an issue. But as soon as I walk into English class or am assigned an essay for homework, I'm once again forced to confront my struggles. <laughs> and I'm not alone. It's estimated that as much as 17% of our population has dyslexia and with many more cases unreported. Although dyslexia is highly heritable, there's really no way to know at birth if you have dyslexia or not. If your parents have it, you have a good chance of having it, but you can't just know straight out of the womb. And so the only way to know is through going through school and then showing signs of struggle, which are usually detected around ages seven or eight. And so up until this point, and in many cases, even after this point, many students go through school hearing things like, oh, she's really bright, she's just lazy. Or, you know, 
If she would just try a little bit harder and be less sloppy with her work, she would do great in school. And I can tell you from personal experience, hearing these and all these things throughout your childhood and into your adult life is totally crushing when you are actively trying your hardest. It, sense, it crushes your sense of self-worth and self-confidence. And without diagnosis or a strong support system at home helping you through school, many dyslexic students feel so hopeless as to drop out completely because they don't feel like they belong. In fact, some of our world's most extraordinary minds gave up on a classic education because they failed to think in this linear way. What does the Model T automobile, incandescent light bulb, Indiana Jones, and the theory of relativity all have in common? They were all created by dyslexic geniuses who struggled and in some cases even failed out of school. So what does this say about our education system? Why is it that some of our world's most successful people felt so unsuccessful in their education system as to give up completely in order to try and succeed in something else? I think these success stories are particularly interesting when juxtaposed against the estimate that 50% of prison inmates have dyslexia. Now, that's not to say that dyslexics have this innate predisposition to be criminals, but rather to illustrate the potential and severe consequences of growing up feeling like your best isn't good enough and that you will never be enough. Our education system grades our students' ability to think and perform within a box. Our understanding of material is graded by our ability to regurgitate momentarily memorized information onto an exam in the course of an hour. Our intellectual capacity is measured by our ability to compute math equations or read as quick or quicker than our peers. Even our sense of self-worth is indirectly determined by something as trivial as being able to shade in the right bubble on an answer sheet. But what is this really testing? I believe that the reason why people with dyslexia opt out of trying to succeed in the system is because our thinking doesn't work in this mechanical, linear way. We constantly think and perform outside of this box and go through school getting penalized for it with bad grades and persistent feelings of inadequacy. There's an old quote I recently learned that says, if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will grow up its whole life believing it's stupid. <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's a seemingly ridiculous quote. Why are we speculating about the metacognitive abilities of a fish, let alone its ability to be out of water long enough to climb a tree, but that's exactly what I'm trying to say. It's ridiculous. We are literally judging a human's intelligence based off of its ability to perform a single task that doesn't even directly prove the very thing it claims to be testing. <laughs> so, working with this metaphor, what if we taught in a way that didn't exclude 17% of the population? What if we nurtured this difference like a gift and taught dyslexic students how to take advantage of their dis different ability instead of letting them think they have a disability? Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to discredit the struggles of dyslexic students. I am very familiar with the disadvantages that come along with struggling to read, write, and spell in our classic education system. What I am trying to do is shift our definition of dyslexia away from focusing on the one associated weakness and start to finally highlight the unique, exceptional abilities that the dyslexic mind truly possesses. What do those look like, you might ask? Well. Let's ask Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson is one of the world's most successful athletes. He's a famous point guard. And he was, in fact, able to succeed on the level that he did, in part due to his dyslexia. So one of these dyslexic gifts is this enhanced sensitivity and awareness for peripheral motion. And so he was able to utilize this skill in order to carry out these sneaky no-look passes where he wouldn't even have to move his head to shoot the ball with somebody to the other side of the court. And these gifts don't just stop in the world of athletics translates into art, and something that I thought was super interesting was astrophysics. So in a study conducted by scientists at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, they found that dyslexic astrophysicists were able to pull out graphical simulations of black holes amongst a bed of noise much quicker and more accurately than the non-dyslexic astrophysicists. All right, I'm no pro in the world of astrophysics, but from my research, I have conducted that this was a very desirable trait for the industry, so two points dyslexia. In fact, Galileo, the very father of observational astronomy, was speculated to have dyslexia. And it was because of his holistic, wide lens way of thinking and seeing that he was literally able to see patterns in the stars, which then led to the discovery of Jupiter's four moons. 
when you think about the sheer number of scientific breakthroughs, number one hits, revolutionary inventions, and ingenious works of art that have been carried out, created, or developed by dyslexic thinkers, it's truly remarkable. And perhaps the most paradoxical part of it all is that most all of these people were made to feel inadequate or stupid in school, maybe even disabled. But were these people disabled? Was Cher disabled? Was Muhammad Ali disabled? As Matthew Schnepps, an incredibly successful dyslexic astrophysicist, once said, it's not that I did all these things and just happened to have dyslexia. It's because I have dyslexia that I was able to do all these things. And I resonate with that. Imagine if we had a specialized institution like that which we have for the musically gifted that worked towards nurturing the dyslexic abilities I mentioned before. Imagine if we had a Juilliard School of Music, but for the talent of dyslexia. Instead of identifying these people as having disabilities, what if we recognized and fostered their unique abilities? How many more Einsteins or Edisons would we have sitting in our school system rather than our prison system? Think about that. It's possible that the very person who might grow up to discover the next major planet might not be reliably able to spell the word astrophysics. <laughs> but why does that matter? What is that even measuring? <sighs> it may seem to be the best option to educate for the masses, but when you think about thousands of kids struggling through school believing that they are handicapped in some way, we might just be excluding the next F. Scott Fitzgerald or Henry Ford from pushing and advancing our societies forward. We really need to change the way that we think of education from this one-size-fits-most model to a more holistic, well-rounded collection of styles. For every dyslexic genius like Walt Disney or Louis Pasteur who reinvented their field through sheer dedication and intellect, there are thousands of kids who feel hopeless and lost just because they struggled in school and as a result feel they don't have a place in our society. I can say that from my personal experience as a dyslexic learner, simply typing my notes, rereading textbooks, and taking written exams won't cut it for me. <laughs> I failed enough exams to say that confidently. What took me until freshman year of college to realize is that the way I study looks a whole lot different than the way that I was taught to study in school. And what I'm still learning till this day is, <laughs> that's okay. Through my research, I have found that dyslexics have this natural affinity for colors and shapes, whereas non-dyslexics might have it for letters and numbers. Letters and numbers are what are seen as practical and thus are valued more in our society, and we're taught to forget about you know, colors and shapes and grow up after elementary school, become adults. But what? Why? That's not how I work. That's not how dyslexic people work. When were you ever given a proper lesson on the art of color coding in school? Or how to use image associations to study for an exam? Never, right? <laughs> These are both very valid ways, and for some people, more valid than a study guide, ways of studying for an exam, but we're just not taught them in school. So through my own collection of trial and error throughout my entire academic life, I have finally found the most effective way for me to study. And I can tell you this, it is not through typing up my notes. <laughs> it's through the use of these things called mind maps. Now, mind maps are artistic representations of how terms and concepts connect. So pretty much by sketching them out, shading them in, turning them into art, I've been able to commit years of material to memory that I can still retrieve till this day. Now, I cannot say the same about the hundreds of study guides I made back in high school. So to my brother, or maybe even to you, a non-dyslexic thinker, this collection of drawings might look like complete chaos. <laughs> but to me, this makes sense. To me, a full page of a textbook looks like complete chaos, <laughs> but to each their own. Is this better or worse than a study guide? No, it's just different. Is Eli less intelligent than me because he struggles to draw? <laughs> of course not, <laughs> that's ridiculous. So why is it that I should feel less intelligent than him when I struggle to read? See what I'm saying here? Spelling and reading fluency are not the only two ways of measuring intellect. And we're finally starting to realize this and make the necessary changes to include other thinking styles. For example, STEM, 
an interdisciplinary curriculum designed to educate students for careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, is largely now being changed to STEAM to include an A that represents the arts. This is a step in the right direction, but there's still so much that needs to be done. If you do not have dyslexia and you're watching this, the next time you see a classmate or a colleague maybe stumble on a word or spell something wrong, know that there's more than what meets the eye. She's not stupid or incapable. If she was, she wouldn't be giving you a TED Talk today. <laughs> And to those of you with dyslexia, no matter your age, the next time you fail an English exam or spell something wrong in a professional email for the 15th time this week, <laughs> I hope that you feel proud before you feel embarrassed. You have worked twice as hard to get to where you are today and no one can take that away from you. It is through these struggles that you have built the perseverance and character that are trademarks of a person with dyslexia. My ultimate goal is that our education system diversifies its teaching methods to match the neurodiversity of its students. There's not one brain type, so let's stop educating people and teaching them as if there is. I believe the first step in doing this is changing our framework with regards to dyslexia and other learning differences for that matter. Let's stop looking at them as disabilities and finally start to recognize and foster their unique, different abilities. Thank you.